Coping with COVID and In It Together present Wellness Wednesday, brought to you by the Diabetes Advisory Council of South Carolina and DHEC's Division of Diabetes and Heart Disease Management. Coping, Coping with COVID with Trey Taylor. Fight the spread and take a stand against coronavirus. Wear a mask in public. Stay at least six feet apart from others and get tested. Join us and fight the spread. Visit scdheg.gov slash COVID-19. Happy Wednesday, Wellness Wednesday, and it together, SC and the South Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council present Wellness Wednesday every Wednesday right here on Coping with COVID. I'm Trey Taylor. And listen, the percentage of African-Americans that have been vaccinated is in the single digits. As of last week, 6% of African-Americans compared with 63% of Caucasian Americans that have received it. Now, in honesty, the percentage is low in other ethnicities also, but the African-American numbers are significant based on the number of black and brown people in the United States. Now we know that there is skepticism. We also know the problem is access where black folk live. Today, we are trying to provide some information, facts over fiction, and experiences to help ease tensions and bring awareness about the importance of getting the COVID vaccine. We'll have a vaccine roundtable with uh, medical professionals, lawmakers, and also folks of the cloth. Dr. Sylvia Boli joins us from Virginia. Also, Dr. Humna Fayaz also joins us from the faith community, Bishop Eric Freeman from The Meeting Place and Reverend Raphael Ashford from St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And on the political side, State Representative Annie McDaniel, and uh, we should be joined a little bit later by Marvin Pendarvis. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Oh, hey, Marvin. Is he there? Oh, there you go. I didn't see you down there back then, down there in the cut. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that would be the right way to put it. In the cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are so glad that all of you have joined us today. We're looking forward to a uh, great conversation. And uh, hopefully when we come back, well, Marvin will be able to, uh, to join us again. That and more coming up next on Coping with COVID. But first, your COVID community updates. More South Carolinians can get vaccinated. Beginning Monday, anyone 55 years or older can make an appointment for a COVID vaccine, and those over 16 that have pre-existing conditions are also eligible. Now, that includes correctional workers, farmers, homeless, shelter, residents, and employees, and, of course, teachers. Now, speaking of teachers, school districts are finalizing vaccination plans. Lexington Richland 5 is partnering with MUSC for shots on e-learning days. Kershaw County is working with Kershaw Health, Sumter and Richland One will vaccinate teachers through Prisma, and Newberry says they're looking at a local provider to handle vaccinations. While teachers are glad to be in the number, they wish the governor would have prioritized them even in this plan. With $2.7 million of but 2.7 million more people able to roll up their sleeves, the concern is that there will not be enough vaccinations available. SCDHEC has your most up-to-date list of times, dates, and locations for COVID testing, vaccinations, and also flu testing in and around South Carolina. Visit scdheck.gov for more information. Now, throughout the show, you'll see information about testing, about vaccinations, about job information scrolling on the bottom of the screen. So please continue to check the bottom of the screen throughout the show. Now, you can also go to gogettested.com. In several states, you can make an appointment, get tested, and get your results in 48 hours. That's gogettested.com. The DHEC Care Line is also available for information on testing, transportation, and if you want to organize a COVID screening at your event or in your community. And speaking of transportation, if you or someone you know is immobile and unable to get to a COVID test or even a vaccination in uh, Kershaw and Richland counties, uh, paramedics there are doing in home COVID screenings. You can uh, call 911 for more information. Now, Lexington Medical Center is also doing uh, COVID vaccinations. You see the information there on your screen for more information. Again, uh, more people, 2.7 million South Carolinians are now able to get vaccinated. So uh, make sure you go, go get your vaccination. Lexington Medical Center is one of those places. Now, if you are a vet, the VA is handling all veteran COVID vaccinations. You see that information also on the screen. A couple of pharmacies in South Carolina are also covering the uh, COVID vaccination, Kroger Pharmacies and also 
CVS pharmacies, all offering COVID vaccines. Now, if you or someone you know is a senior citizen and having some challenges actually making your appointment, Get Set Up is a website and a phone number that seniors can call and log on to, and they'll help walk you through making your appointment. Now, the NAACP Housing Assistance Program is still going on. They have navigators that will help uh, tenants and folks who have a mortgage and renters navigate the uh, problems that you may be having with uh, keeping your housing. Also, the South Carolina Bar Association and SC Legal Services have collaborated. They have a uh, website and also a uh, 1-800 number if you need help with mortgage or mortgage assistance. The city of Columbia continues their six-month payment plan for water bills. You could even get up to 75% of a payment on your water bill. And the Central Carolina Community Foundation is offering $3 million in scholarships. Now, these are not only scholarships for students, but also for adults. Log on to the Central Carolina Scholarship Fund website for more information. Folks still working and learning from home. And if you're having some challenges, Rashonda Pratt has some amazing information on her YouTube channel. Please go over there, hit like and share and get the information you need for e-learning and e-working. ACA open enrollment is continuing through May 15th. Rosalind Goodwin with the uh, South Carolina Hospital Association joined us a couple of weeks ago to tell us all about it. Here's the information here. Again, if you or someone you know needs some help signing up, visit signupsc.org or call the toll-free number. Of course, you can also go to healthcare.gov. If you need a J-O-B, Rapid Reliable is testing. They have uh, job openings. Uh, go to that website, ambulix.com backslash careers for more information. And uh, they also are offering COVID testings and will also be offering vaccinations very soon. Finally, it's Women's History Month and the WNBA has an effort celebrating women of color. You can uh, purchase this t-shirt or a hoodie and a portion of the proceeds will go to the National Council of Negro Women. Celebrate women of color in the WNBPA. I'm Trey Taylor and uh, you're watching Coping with COVID. It's Wellness Wednesday and it's Together SC and the Diabetes Advisory Council present Wellness Wednesday every Wednesday here on Coping with COVID. And uh, we're actually streaming live on the In It Together Facebook page. Please go over there, hit like and share and get the information you need about a diabetes prevention program. Again, if you or someone you know has diabetes and they need the information to help get them through the process, they have several resources available in an inclusive group setting, virtual, so that anyone in the state can not only get the information they need, but also get the support they need. Coping with COVID is also streaming live on the TaylorMade production page. That's the home of uh, Coping with COVID. If you would, we would love for you to go over there and hit like and share and follow. Not only will you be able to check out Coping with COVID Wednesday through Friday, and then on first Mondays uh, with George Wallace, you'll also get all of your COVID-related updates. We're also streaming live on YouTube. Want to thank everybody that's watching on YouTube. YouTube, please hit the subscribe button so that uh, you'll get notifications on when we go live. We also have a presence on um, Instagram and on Twitter. So please hit like, share, and follow. I want to thank you all so much again for uh, joining us. I want to say hi to Deshauna Chanel. Thank you for watching. Also, Rosie Barnes says, good afternoon. Sharice Hudson says, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And Alice Noel said, uh, she's watching. She and Art Noel are watching. I want to thank you guys so much for watching Coping with COVID and uh, Wellness Wednesday brought to you by the South Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council and In It Together SC. I want you guys to post and share this information out so we can get the message to the masses because this is such a big problem, particularly, hey, Anita Aiken is also watching, particularly in communities of color, because we are just not getting vaccinated. It is our vaccination roundtable discussion with doctors, faith community, and lawmakers. And we want to get this message out because like I said, with 2.7 million more people eligible in South Carolina with the opening of the new phase and the vaccine percentage in single digits, 6% of people of color, 
the conversation and outreach must continue. We're going to open up our vaccine roundtable discussion with our physicians. Dr. Hume Na Fayez is a medical consultant for the Division of Acute Disease at DHEC, where she provides training to health regions, providers, and the public, and leadership for policy development. Thank you so much, Dr. Fayez, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Absolutely. Dr. Sylvia Boulay, Boulay joins us from Virginia. She's a dual certified internal medicine and obesity physician with Embrace Your Wellness. She was with us last week if uh, you joined us on the show. And we asked her to come back this week, Dr. Fayaz, because she wrote a very interesting blog about the fact that as a woman of color, she had skepticism herself, a woman of color, a physician, uh, a learned physician, you know, she, she knows, uh, dual certified, but even she had some skepticism. And I wanted her to come on just to kind of talk about that. Sh share with us, um, Dr. Boley, what your concerns were, and you're on mute. All right. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Hi. Um, as you said, I'm Dr. Sylvia Bowley. I'm a dual board certified obesity expert and a healthy lifestyle champion and a great listener. And I am founder of Embrace You Weight and Wellness. But during the pandemic, so from March of 2020 to just January of this year, I actually worked on the front lines. I was lead physician at a skilled nursing facility. Um, I worked as an independent contractor at a skilled nursing facility. And I worked on the front lines through two big COVID outbreaks in our facility. Um, I was there and even with the rollout of the vaccine program for our staff, because we were amongst the first to be vaccinated. And so you would think that after literally working, I mean, it was scary the first time that I found that one of my patients had COVID and making that decision, do I go in or do I telework? But that day, you know, I'm a person of faith. So I prayed with my husband and you know, we decided if to, you know, I had that peace to just go in and do what I had taken a Hippocratic oath to do, which right. was to serve my patients. So I put all the PPE on and did that. So that patient unfortunately passed. My first patient with COVID literally coded in front of my eyes and doing CPR. We did everything. And it was, it was very, so early on, I learned how rapidly this disease could take effect and how it could just devastate and cause death. So you would think with all of that, that I would be running to get the vaccine. <laughs> but it, um, I think for me, my main apprehension, I call myself a, a self-professed cool nerd, right? So I love science. I love sci-fi and things like that. So I was letting this new, the, because it's a new science compared to the older vaccine technology that we use, where we're usually using actually a killed particle from the virus or we're using live virus. So like your flu vaccine and those things that we're used to. So the mRNA technology, this this um, new kind of technology where it would be entering into your cells and then causing co the coding was what was freaking me out. And I was having visions of the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, way too much Netflix. So I think that was um, that was kind of what really was scaring me initially. I mean, in the community, and I've done several of these talks by now. That's part of what prompted me to do my blog post and put it out there was because I hear all types of things. People reference the Tuskegee study, um, yeah. which was you know is a historic one here in the U.S. in which men with syphilis were with yeah. Health from penicillin. So people ref will reference that. Um, people reference things that it's never going to leave your cells once it gets in. Um, people will reference that it's going to change your DNA and all of these um, these things. And so, and or they talk about the speed with which it's perceived that the vaccine was made. So I hear all of these things, and yes, they circulate. It is circulating in my mind. So I think the first thing that I had to do was really take a step back and address my fear because what I find, and this is both 
physiological, so both like within the body and then it's psychological and it's spiritual, right? We have faith leaders on here, but when we are operating in a fear mindset or when we're being led by fear, we can't make logical decisions. Our amygdala, which is our pri primitive brain, the lower part of our brain, it takes over and hijacks our co higher level cognitive function. And that's what I saw as a clinician. Here I am, I know all the data, I know everything, I know scientific reasoning, but when I was operating in fear, that went out the window and right. I needed to really take a step back and adjust, address that fear first so that I could be able to process the information and the data that was being given in a logical way. Right. Yeah. That makes so such great points, um, Dr. Bowley, because but and, and here's the thing, uh, Dr. Fayaz, if her, her, she as a trained professional is having that, imagine what folks like me who can't even get y'all names right. You know what I'm saying? No, of course. Uh, it's, it's having, you know, and, and not necessarily me, but people in our community, particularly mm -hmm. communities of color. And we see it in the statistics. Folks are just not getting vaccinated. What are you saying? I, and that's absolutely what we're seeing. As a DHEC consultant, we get questions from our constituents daily. And instead of, I guess, uh, trying to tackle why is there mistrust because we have history right. and history full of why is there mistrust. Mm -hmm. um, even going way before um, Tuskegee, and I know that that's something that is definitely um, like harbors. It's a big up. thing. Yeah. Yes. But even going back, um, you know, it's I come into these talks sometimes and I try to say that I'm not trying to be political. But when you realize when you're talking about mistrust and the vaccine, I think physicians, being a physician and being educated and knowing the history of how medicine came about, it's almost impossible to remove physicians from the political, you know, um, atmosphere that was going on. So one example before Tuskegee is when the when the ships came over and with the slaves and the doctors would be used on retainer by plantation owners to go out and um, you know examine who they're going to go find at and at these auctions for slaves. So it's really hard to stay um, completely, completely compartmentalize medicine from the political atmosphere. Um, and so I completely agree. I think the more educated you get, the more um, it, it almost, it, you go into a rabbit hole, but I think the, the productive aspect of that is knowing how to speak to patients and, you know, what can I do to combat this mistrust rather than dissecting this obvious history of mistrust, which is going to be there. Yeah, we're talking to uh, Dr. Hume Nafayaz and uh, Dr. Sylvia Boli about uh, the COVID vaccine. So let's talk about, let's debunk some of these myths. Let's talk about what it is and what it ain't, okay? <laughs> Okay, well, um, just to give an update, I know that um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has come out, so that's brought up right. more questions. And because, that's one shot, right? Yes, and so I think the public, um, you know, finally uh, got comfortable with understanding the mRNA <laughs> vaccine. Um, and those are th those are too many words for someone that's never, you know, Absolutely. we've studied this for <laughs> so mm -hmm. long. Um, but just to give an update on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it is not an mRNA vaccine, but works similarly, similarly where it uses a vector um, just like the Moderna and um, unlike the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, it uses um, a completely different vector to get into your cells, but then does the similar system where it, um, it goes ahead and tells your cells how to make a certain protein so that your cells can recognize them in the future. And just some okay. points to take away from that is that it's not its not putting any DNA in your body. It's, it is unable to give you COVID-19. Um, and there's the, the common ingredients in it are sugars, lipids, salts, and polysorbate, which is another ingredient that is in um, common laxatives that you can buy over the counter. There's no antibiotics, no eggs, no preservatives, and no, um, a question that we commonly get is metals. Um, there, there's no mercury or aluminum in this new vaccine either. So that's one big um, thing that needs, I think that is hard to, um, just because these vaccines seem to have rolled out so fast, it's more so the manufacturing that rolled out 
quicker than usual. And that's mostly because of the funding, um, the actual science behind it has existed for years. Right. And I do want to mention that again, because we've talked about that a lot on this show, that because of SARS, which is a kind of COVID, the technology, the research has been going on. When SARS disappeared or dissipated, the research stopped. And then when COVID came back in and you got just breaking it down and, you know, just common <laughs> people terms, when COVID yeah. came back in, the research started back up, correct? Mm hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So and really the research continued. I mean, even after, so it started in like 2003, but they continued, they published the paper as recently as 2018. So even before we saw COVID-19 there, so co coronavirus, which is the root general class of the viruses that have been studied for years, really, if you want to go there for since like the fifties, right? And right. when we saw SARS, then we saw MERS again, the Middle Eastern strain of it in 2012. So the research was going on, it wasn't very popular research, which is why the scientists were having to find basically labs that would support them to do this research, but it, it has it was ongoing, which is why we were able to mobilize so quickly. And I think that's a very important point for people to realize because people say, oh, it just came up. How it just came it? up, right. It's, yeah. it's been going on and that's why we were able to mobilize because they finally got the funding, the support and the community recognized the need for the type of technology they were creating. Right. And as you said, the need was there because now we're hit with this health pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, in it together, SC and the South Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council present Wellness Wednesday every Wednesday here on Coping with COVID. I'm Trey Taylor, Dr. Humna Fayaz with uh, SC DHEC and Dr. Sylvia, Sylvia Boulay, Boulay is uh, also joining us. And uh, we're having our vaccine roundtable. Coming up, we're going to talk with uh, uh, State Representative Annie McDaniel and also Dr. Um, Pastor Raphael Ashford with St. Luke, Luke and uh, Dr. Bishop Eric Freeman with... Um, I can't remember the church. He's gonna. They're gonna join. They're gonna join us. I just got a a. a, a uh, he's down there smiling at me. I just got a brain. <laughs> I need a vaccine or something or a shot of ginkgo biloba. I keep saying that. I need some ginkgo biloba. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> some coffee. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a coffee drinker. I'm a tea drinker. I can't take the caffeine. I can't take it, girl. I'd be all over the place. But I want to say hi to Renee Nelson. She says, blessings, everyone. Thank everyone for watching. I want you to post and share this information out because we want to get this message out because this is a real problem among mm -hmm. black and brown communities. We are getting vaccinated. It's 6%, 6% for black and brown folks, as opposed to 63% in other communities. And uh, we've got to get this conversation out there. Let's talk a little bit more about the J&J, &J, which is the new uh, vaccine, Dr. Fayez. Um, mm -hmm. So why is it just one shot as opposed to Moderna and Pfizer being two shots? Because people are saying now, oh, okay, now it's one shot. Is it less effective? Oh, that is a great question. So for this, for the mRNA vaccine, like I said, uh, because it's their two shots are needed to provide the breast protection. Um, the first shot primes the immune system, helping it recognize the virus. So basically something going into your body, helping it recognize and building those building blocks for your cells to recognize that protein on the virus. And then the second shot strengthens the immune response. That is why Pfizer and Moderna, the mRNA vaccines require two doses because the first one primes your system. Um, this, unlike the, unlike the two dose vaccines, the newest one, Johnson and Johnson, um, requires one because instead of having to prime the system, it goes in with its own, um, harmless vaccine particle that it uses to enter the body and already it it doesn't have to prime the system that way. It doesn't have that mRNA component that teaches your cells how to make that spike protein. It goes in it already, that's how your cell will detect it. Um, so it's its just the difference in vaccine, um, you know, how it was created. Um, and what we are seeing with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the one shot, um, obviously it will make it more, uh, it'll make it easier for people that do not, you know, cannot go in for two shots. Yeah, and, yeah. But on top of that, it has shown to have increased efficacy for 
um, significant adverse reaction or adverse effects of COVID-19. Um, and I want to pull up just some data um, because I know what's floating around is, um, you know, the differences in the 95% effectivity for the Pfizer and Moderna versus the 68% um, effectivity for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, however, if you look look into the research that they've done, the vaccine eff efficacy against severe disease and death, which is what we are, you know, that's what we, that the goal of this right, vaccine right, is. Right, right, right. We don't want it to get is, sick or die. Exactly. So after 28 days hospitalizations, uh, the vaccine efficacy was 100%. And then deaths after 28 days, after the single dose Johnson & Johnson was 100%. Um, and so the communities that have suffered the most, you can see those numbers by hospitalizations and deaths. And this vaccine does just that. Right. So it prevents, it, it prevents, it protects. It doesn't protect. Protects against, it, yeah. it protects, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's what I want to talk about. Pre prevents as opposed to protect. Mm -hmm. Because nothing can't prevent. Because there is still a chance you could get it. But it protects you tremendously against mm -hmm. passing away or getting sick. Correct? It, that is correct. So they are still studying the asymptomatic spread, which mean, which is more of a preventive measure, is seeing if someone isn't showing signs um, asymptomatic spread, that is something that the research, um, we're still finding that out about this vaccine. Um, however, it has been shown um, from the data that they that Johnson & Johnson has released is that the vaccine efficacy against severe disease and death, um, that's proven. Um, and of course, there are preventive me measures that we could, can that we, I encourage everyone to continue doing, wear a ma wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, yeah. all of those is, falls under preventive measures that you can do at home. I want to say hi to Juliet Green. She said she had her first one today. Betty Fletcher also said she got her first vaccine this morning. Uh, ladies, please comment as to what your experiences were and if you had any, um, any, any symptoms, any problems with it. Have the two of you gotten your vaccines? So I have not. I am consulting, consulting, working from home. Um, I have signed up for it now um, just because I didn't fit under, for right. me, writing, we at DHEC, we, and being part of the Vaccine Advisory Committee, writing the, regu like, the guidance and um, the recommendations for who should fall under a certain group. And I, just like I say to constituents is you should wait your turn. And yeah. so now um, I will wait until it is my turn when I am back to being public facing. And right. I go back into clinic in July. So I will definitely get it before then. But yeah. until then, um, working from my house, um, it, it didn't feel, I, I felt almost um, like I would be doing a disservice by jumping the line and yeah. jumping into 1A. Yeah, because I was gonna say, are you? I was gonna say you are not fifty-five. Uh, you, you're fifty-five and under. You cannot be fifty-five because if you are, you should be talking about the fountain of youth pill that you're. <laughs> you. No, no, no. I don't know that. What about you, uh, Doctor Bowley? Um, yes, yeah, so I've got in mind um, after much trepidation, I did get mine and um, because I was definitely on the front lines and I needed to be also an example because there were a lot of healthcare workers that were also afraid there too. So I had my, I did the Pfizer and I had my second dose on the 8th of February and I've been doing great since then. So the first dose I got on the 1st of the 18th of January, um, I had arm soreness. My arm was really sore for the first 24 hours, but after that, that went away and I had no other symptoms after that. And the second time I had less arm soreness, it lasted less than 24 hours. Right. Uh, educator uh, Kimberly Johnson, said so she's an educator waiting her turn. Well, your turn comes on Monday, girlfriend. So uh, you, you'll be in the number if you live in South Carolina. Juliet Green says the day after she said she had chills and felt very cold. She says she was told that that was a sign of the vaccine working. What should people expect, Dr. Fayez? So definitely after the, after the first dose, the soreness in the arm, that's expected similar to the flu shot. And like I said, the 
the difference between the two vaccines is the first shot is priming the system. That's why many people report after the second dose, that's when they feel the more robust symptoms of lethargy, pain, because at that point, you're, that is a good sign um, that your body has recognizes it and is fighting it off as if you know there is an infection. One thing I am recommending people not to do um, that the CDC has come out with recently, as more and more of the population gets vaccinated, we are not encouraging going out and getting antibody tests done um, because I think um, it is confusing for the public because if the antibody test shows that you've had infection before, that should be, or theoretically you would think that would be a marker of immunity or seeing if this vaccine worked. Um, but the antibody tests that we have commercially available don't detect all the antibodies that your body's making, um, and especially the ones that are specific to the vaccine. So mm -hmm. yes, there may be some that are positive on the antibody test after they receive vaccine, but I think the majority would, I, it, I wouldn't use it as an indicator of whether the vaccine has worked or not. Right. All right. We're talking to Dr. Humna Fayaz with uh, SCD Heck and Dr. Sylvia Bully, Bo Bole. I don't know why I can't get that. Bole with uh, um, is, is a physician in uh, the Virginia area. Rosie Barnes says tomorrow will be two weeks uh, that she got her second shot. Betty Fisher said her arm is starting to get sore. And uh, we also have um, Phaedra Walker, who says she currently has an autoimmune disease called polymitosis, which she takes weekly injections for. She said this led to her also developing lung fibrosis with a partially collapsed lower left lung. She says, although she signed up for the vaccine, she's a little reluctant to get it. Please advise, she asks. Thank you, Phaedra, for your question. Ladies? So, um, Ms. Phaedra, um, I would so I would recommend going ahead and getting this vaccine. There is no contraindication to methotrexate for patients that have polymyositis. Um, and also the chronic lung fibrosis that you've noted is actually a risk factor for um, a significant um, adverse effect of COVID-19. Um, and so when you weigh the risk and benefit of hospitalization or disease from COVID-19 versus the contraindications that have not been identified, um, I would I definitely encourage you to get the vaccine. And also in phase 1B, chronic lung conditions are included. Um, so you would be eligible um, if you fall in the age 16 to 50, 55 um, to, to receive vaccine. I would recommend it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Phaedra, so much for your question. Thank you, Dr. Fayaz, for uh, your answer. And uh, we've got one more comment before we go to the break. And then I want to bring the other, um, the other, other panelists. And Diane Williams says uh, she's got her, oh yeah, fist up. I guess that means she's going to go ahead and get her vaccine. <laughs> uh, uh, we were supposed to hear from uh, attorney Marvin Pendarvis. I don't think he is on yet because I don't see him backstage. But uh, Dr. Boley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for us sharing your information. She is um, a, a board, a dual board certified physician in Maryland. I said, Virginia, yes. Last week I did say you're from Maryland and today I read somewhere that you were from Virginia. So I thought I was saying it wrong last week. So thank you so much for uh, joining us again today. Uh, Dr. Um, Fayaz is going to come back and join us. She's going to be joined by some folks from the faith community, Bishop Eric Freeman with The Meeting Place, Reverend Raphael Ashford with St. Luke's Episcopal, and on the political side, State Representative Annie McDaniel. They're going to rejoin us to talk more about the COVID vaccine and what is our responsibility to get shots in the arms of people of color. That's coming up next on Wellness Wednesday on Coping with COVID. It's brought to you by In It Together SC and the South Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council. I'm Trey Taylor. We're going to take a really short break and come right back. Need health insurance? Call Javis at 803-419-1001. Javis can get you health insurance premiums as low as zero, plus other low cost and affordable options. 803-419-1001. Let Javis help you file your taxes. And if you need it, get a cash advance from $500 to $6,000. Javis Tax Services, 803-419-1001. Javis Tax Services. JavisTax.com. 
I'm Trey Taylor, and you are watching Coping with COVID, updates on the pandemic and information to help you thrive and survive COVID-19. It's Wellness Wednesday, and it's brought to you by In It Together SC and the South Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council. Listen, we are streaming live on the In It Together Facebook page. Please go over there and hit like and share. And if you need more information about a diabetes prevention program, please go to the uh, In It Together Facebook page and the In It Together website for more information. Of course, please continue to post and share this information out. This is good information we need to get to uh, the masses because it's a big deal and we are not getting the information. Black and brown folks are just not getting the information that we need in order to save our lives. I want to say hi to uh, Alice Noel for watching. Phaedra Walker says, thank you so much. Peace and blessings to you too, beautiful. Uh, I'm Trey Taylor. We're joined again by Dr. Humna Fayaz, a medical consultant for the Division of Acute Disease at DHEC. And from the faith community, Bishop Eric Freeman with The Meeting Place, Reverend Raphael Ashford with St. Luke's Episcopal Church, and on the political side, State Representative Annie McDaniel. Now, Marvin Pendarvis, says that he is here, but I don't see him. Lauren, our producer, if you see him, if you can please bring him up, that would be great. I don't see him. It's, uh, it says, actually, it, I, I don't see him, so I'm not sure uh, how to bring him up. But Lauren, if you can, I'm talking to the producer now. So Lauren, if you can help us bring him in, that would be great because we would love for him to be joined in on the conversation. He keeps saying he's here, but I don't see him. <laughs> So I don't see you, Marvin. <laughs> so listen, thank you all so much for joining us today. And this is such an important conversation because as I said, black and brown people, 6%, 6% of black and brown people are, have gotten vaccinated. 63% of other folks are getting vaccinated. So I want to ask you, Representative McDaniel, because you're in Fairfield County, which is rural, if, if respectfully, it's basically rural. What are you hearing from your constituents? What I'm he hearing, oh, well, first of all, um, Trey, thank you so much for having me and Absolutely. giving me an opportunity. Uh, what I've been hearing from most of my constituents in rural uh, Fairfield County is access to the vaccine. We have individuals who um, they've been afraid to go out because of, because of COVID. They've been um, at home, shut in. They're not sure who to trust to uh, take them to get the vaccine. I've had some contact me and tell me that they received the first vaccine. When they tried to schedule the second vaccine, they were told they had to go back to the place of the first. Um, and after talking to the Lieutenant Governor, I understand that's what we are trying to uh, put in place now where you receive your first and second at the same place. But I think we've been a little um, probably um, um, not considerate of the fact that those individuals who took it when it first came out, they wasn't given an opportunity to schedule that second vaccine. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a little uh, gap there that we need to try to fill for those individuals. Um, That's my <laughs> alarm. <laughs> okay. But I've been running... Ahead. Okay, I've been running inter interference for most of my constituents who've been contacting me and making sure that they received it. Some have contacted the, the providers and they were told that they were only giving it to their patients. So we had to correct that. So I think, I know at least in Fairfield, it's been a lot due to access as well as the fear. But I think most of them are getting beyond the fear. I think uh, we've been doing, doing a great job with the media and helping them understand that to get the vaccine could cause you a lot more harm and damage than not getting the vaccine. Because we do know that COVID has killed so many individuals and not sure, I don't think there's been any deaths um, due to the vaccine. So unfortunately, I am very heartbroken to hear that only 6%, but I'll be working a little harder to try to get my constituents out. Dr. Fayaz, if people only get one shot and don't go back to get two, what happens? So for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, there isn't enough data to support uh, immunity after um, just getting one shot. Um, and it's not exactly where, you know, you'll be half covered by COVID and you're willing to take your chances. The body doesn't exactly work that way um, when it comes to getting, having a virus infect your body. Um, so I would say that 
we don't have enough data right now to support one shot dosing um, for the mRNA vaccine. Obviously for the Johnson and Johnson, that's in one shot form as it comes. Um, but for Moderna and Pfizer, I would not recommend um, you know, just stopping at one dose. It's not, it's not considered, it's not equivalent to being half vaccinated. Um, it just leaves room for severe disease and hospitalization. And the whole point of getting the vaccine is to stay out of the hospital. Um, so I would recommend getting both doses. Um, and hopefully we have, we are very promising information that we will have Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, we're estimating about 41,000 doses come to South Carolina, um, which will hopefully start being placed at different parts in the state. Um, I don't want to give a certain date yet, but I know it's coming up in the next few days where they will be, they'll be at the locations um, and ready to go. Uh, Bishop Freeman and Reverend Ashford, what's the faith community's responsibility in all of this and helping to get our people on board with this vaccine? Bishop Freeman, I'll ask you first. Trey, first off, thank you again for all uh, that you do to keep our community uh, informed and engaged. And also we are grateful for In It Together and DHEC for their support and to all of my cohorts joining us. Uh, certainly we uh, salute each and every one of you. Uh, your question is a great question and you framed it with a portion of the answer. Uh, you asked what is the faith community's responsibility? And one of our primary responsibilities is to steward well faithfulness and fidelity to teach that a part of how we walk out our faith is stewarding our bodies in a faithful way. Um, our scriptures teach us that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And because the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, God himself dwells within us. We have a responsibility to steward these temples. He doesn't reach down with a stethoscope from the sky and put it on us. We have a responsibility to engage in a way that shows that we are stewards. And uh, my prior background before going to graduate school and seminary, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a number of years. And actually one of the companies that came up with, the company that came up with the very first vaccine. And so I have a little bit of a familiarity with uh, various disease states and uh, the agents that are used to address them. Um, but we as faith leaders have to, I believe, demonstrate and teach that the scriptures uh, model the use of uh, material, the use of science, the use of technology to heal. I always reflect on the gospel of John chapter nine, where it says Jesus came into a particular region, saw a man which was blind, his disciples asked him who sinned, man or his parents, that he should be made born blind or born blind. And Jesus says, let's not try to figure out whose fault this is. Right. Neither man nor his parents have sinned, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. And then Jesus does something very interesting. The same Christ that walked on water, the same Christ that turned water into wine, the same Christ that could have just said, hey, your, your blind eyes are open. The, the, the scripture says he spat on the ground mm -hmm. and made clay a substance. And then he put it on the man's eyes. And then he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. In other words, you be responsible with this particular substance I've put on your eyes. And when he went and washed in, his, in the pool of Siloam, he came back seeing very clearly a substance is there. And as a faith leader, I think we have to uh, challenge our parishioners to engage all the various ways that God gives us to steward our bodies and to walk in healing and in wholeness. And I'll, I'll just stop right there. And Reverend Ashford, I'll, I'll pass it, pass mm -hmm. the uh, proverbial, um, proverbial uh, uh, baton on to you, sir. Reverend Ashford, here's something Go ahead, Reverend Ashford. I'm sorry. Go Thank ahead, you for having me you. back on the uh, service, I mean, on the program, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, sort of uh, what the uh, bishop was saying, I think one of the main things is to educate our parishioners, right. and educate our friends. I've seen so much misinformation on Facebook from people that you would think would know better. And because people tend to believe what they see and not read, they take yeah. that and they spread it and it goes viral. And I even saw something on the news today, and I don't uh, really know all of the medical background as to how vaccines are formulated, but it just sounded so outlandish to me, and someone sent that to me, and I just think because of our past history with being 
uh, distrustful of the um, of the um, medical you know system, rightfully so. I mean, you know, going from Tuskegee to uh, I think it was uh, Henrietta Lacks, and yeah. even I was reading a couple of months ago about this doctor who was hailed as the as the modern of the wait, he was the doctor he was a father of modern gynecology, but yet he was using his techniques on slaves without anesthesia. So all of those things trickle down through through our generations, and we sort of get stuck at Tuskegee for whatever reason, and I yeah. totally get it. However, I think education and really we're in a position where we can really and truly educate our parishioners, our friends that yes, those things did happen. But think about all the things that you have gone to the doctor for since then and have you died or you know right. had some kind of adverse reaction. And unfortunately, politics has creeped in as well. And I have people of color, black, who will say, well, I'm not going to take, they called it something juice because of who they think made it and that person didn't make it it was science who developed it and so i do think we need to lead by example at whatever cost and whatever people might not like what we have to say because some people love conspiracy theories (laughs) (laughs) and some people love to just think that they are right because unfortunately most of us don't like to read. We just catch the big headline and go with that. And I think that has done our community a great disservice. Not only do we not like to read, we're not even going anywhere where reading is going on. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And I'm just being real. Look, I've been black all my life, so I'm not shading black folk. I'm just being real about it. And it's, if, if it's a, if it's a song, if it's a good movie or, you know what I'm saying? So here's my thing. We've got to go to where the people are. We've got to go to where black and brown folk are. We have to talk to your point, uh, Reverend Ashford, how they talk. I mean, and listen, uh, Dr. Fayez, I, you know, all of that medical stuff is great, but nobody mm-hmm. don't know what y'all talking about. You know what I'm saying? I'm just being real about it. You know, that's just going over people's heads. Exactly. So. We've got to be able to, in your meetings with the powers that be, (laughs) you know, we really need to shift the conversation if we really want to get folks vaccinated. Now, do we really want to get folks vaccinated? And if we do, then we have got to carve out the message in the way that people understand it. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you in the Hispanic community, we got to speak Spanish. You know, if if we're in the Indian community, we got to speak I mean, you know, when in Rome, do as Romans do. Uh, Dr. Raphael um, Ashford, uh, I, I gave you, a, I gave you a doctorate last time when you were here. <laughs> Raphael Ashford is with us with a Saint Luke, also uh, Bishop Eric Freeman with the Meeting Place. <clears throat> I want to shout out. Marvin Pendarvis, who came in there with Representative Annie McDaniel. Thank you so much, Marvin, for uh, uh, coming on there for a minute. Uh, Mitchell Peace of Joy Jen said, it's great to see you, Representative McDaniel. Valerie Rump says, we as a people have to be vigilant about pursuing credible information. Valerie, that sounds so good, but um, we're not we're not trying to find out no credible information. We getting what we get and what we get, whether it's right or wrong, that's what we're going with. So, um, Dr. Uh, and and also wanted to mention Dr. Um, Boley, who was with us um, earlier. She said we um, are deceptive to facts. She said uh, the cure to fear is faith. The cure to fear is faith. Are you guys um, saying something from your pulpits? Are you are you speaking, preaching, teaching? Go get the vaccine from your pulpits. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, Trey. Um, I encourage our parishioners to uh, consult with their clinicians for uh, the appropriate course of action um, with respect to their particular situation. And then I model for our congregation as best I can personal stewardship that is honorable. And so I volunteered with Prisma Health uh, uh, about a month ago. And at the end of my period of volunteering, I received uh, the first shot for uh, the vaccine, the Pfizer shot, and right. had images of that that I shared with our congregation uh, just to address a few matters. Number one, um, that that was a demonstration of faith, not a lack of faith. And um, I often use the example of Christ 
when he was being tempted by the adversary to throw himself down and the angels would catch him. And, and Jesus said, that shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And, uh, and so if we have means by which God has given us to uh, safeguard our well-being, uh, that is a demonstration of faithfulness. And, um, and then also to demonstrate that um, here it is almost three weeks later and there's no mark across my head. <laughs> them and um, all the yeah. other various theories that are connected to it. And so I think it's important, number one, to refer uh, parishioners to clinicians or at least to refer them to services that can inform them. And then number two, to model for them uh, personal stewardship that's honorable. Right. Um, Kimberly Johnson says, we appreciate your uh, leadership, Bishop Eric Freeman. He, uh, and uh, Diane Willis says, she says she loves that Bishop Freeman follows God's word, is knowledgeable, and is a role model to the community. He breaks the message down. Thank you for all your commitment, support, and time. Uh, before we get you back in, Dr. Fayez, I want to mm -hmm. get uh, Annie McDaniel back in. Representative McDaniel and Marvin, if he can uh, chime in, uh, what are you guys doing in your communities in the Fairfield County, in Charleston, to uh, kind of help quell the fears and dispel the rumors and and really help people get out. I know Representative McDaniel, you said, you know, folks are concerned about getting that second shot. What are, what are you hearing and what are you doing to help folks feel comfortable? Yes, I know at Fairfield County, and thank you again, Trey. What Absolutely. we're doing, yeah, we're having um, virtual meetings such as this. We are talking to the pastors. We're asking them to encourage their parishioners to um, go ahead and get the vaccine. We have um, several um, human services organizations, our Council on Aging, uh, they're getting the word out and asking them to get vaccinated. Um, I use my Facebook page as a okay. source of information for um, my constituents. And um, when we have the testing sites, we're also making sure that they share with them at the testing sites when we're um, actually vaccinated. Uh, vaccinating them. And I just want to mention real quick, I know Prisma Health will have some buses that will be going out in the rural areas. That's great. Yes. And they will be back um, doing the vac vaccinations. So uh, we want to encourage um, our, our um, persons who have not received the vaccine to please pay attention to the legislators' uh, Facebook pages and social media, because we are posting that information there in addition to what uh, DHEC is doing. And I want to compliment them because they have revved up um, the communication with TV and radio, Absolutely. and we encourage that in virtual shows like what you are doing here today. So um, we're just making sure that we're just trying to spread that word as much as possible. So again, thank you. And also, uh, Representative Hennigan just came in. Oh, okay. Great, I, great, great, can, great. Can I say a few words? Please, please. Yeah. Hey, this is Marvin Pendarvis, everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep my mask on. So. And you masked up. <laughs> yeah, but... um. I, I'm sorry about the technology malfunction. I had it on my phone and for some reason it wasn't, but I was on my way back to the state house anyway. So I said, I'm gonna just go by Annie's office and, and, and uh, <laughs> say, you. hey, but um, I will tell you kind of what's happening in Charleston. And I Please. did hear a lot of the conversation and, and Bishop Freeman, I, I really appreciate all that you said. You you really hit the point home and, and you hit it on the, the head, the nail on the head. I will tell you this. Um, there's no doubt that there's still um, fear in the community as it relates to the vaccine and that there's a reluctancy amongst many community members to get it, uh, whether it's the first shot and certainly the second shot. And so my biggest thing is working with the faith community, uh, working with the community organizations uh, to dispel a lot of that and ensure that people understand that the only way that we're going to get out of this pandemic um, as soon as possible is for us to ensure, obviously we're following all the safety protocols, but making sure that we're doing our due diligence and protecting our families and our loved ones. And that's by getting the vaccine. And right. so the best way I can do it is, is, you know, use the platform that I have, use the bullhorn that I have by sending the message, uh, making sure I'm communicating, whether it be, um, whether it be social media, uh, whether it be through the pastors who have a lot of influence in our communities and, of course, through uh, the community organizations that carry some weight as well. Uh, but the reality is this, Miss Taylor, um, there's, you know, undoubtedly going to be people who are still fearful. 
Absolutely. You know, I'll be frank, and I've communicated with family members who just have, are, are 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 against it, and, and for whatever reason. So I think we have to do as much as we can uh, to reach as many people as we can, and then pray that as we move forward, we get to the point where we're insulated from this. Uh, but um, my fear is this, and 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 and, and I want to say this, people. My fear is this. We saw what happened in Texas recently with the governor there really relaxing some of the restrictions. Yes, yes. And we saw what happened here in South Carolina with the governor saying that he was going to relax some of the restrictions. And couple that with the fact that the administration said that there's hope that we can have full vaccines by May. Right. My fear is people are going to feel like we're back to normal by the summer. Right. And that we're going to end in a, be in a dark place if we're not careful. So we're not out of the woods yet. We're, we're right. not out of the woods. And this isn't the time to get comfortable. I know people are antsy. People want to go travel and they want to hang out with their friends and, and do different things. And it's getting warm. And you know how it is when the weather gets warm. Uh, but uh, we still have to, to take our precautions and do our due diligence. So. I just want to thank you for the opportunity. I apologize for, for the malfunction, but it was good. important for me that I, I got an opportunity to just talk with you and your show uh, for your guests and, and obviously the esteemed panel that you put together. Well, thank you so much, um, Representative Penn Jarvis, for coming and sharing you know, what's going on in your community. I appreciate it. So Dr. Fayez, uh, as we wrap up the conversation, you heard what everyone is saying. So I want to know from you for one, one thing, what is going to happen uh, in May? Oh, Representative Hennigan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Leon Peterkin says, hello, my dear cousin, Patricia Moore Hennigan. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so before I, I bring the doctor back in, um, Representative Hennigan, who is the chair of the South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus, do you want to say something before I bring uh, Dr. Fayez in? Back I, I just want to thank you all for allowing me, since I could not be on to bring some other people to take my place, I knew that the ones that I asked would do a dynamic job, and I know it. I look forward to being on your next one. <laughs> thank and you. I thank you. I thank you, all of you all, for being on, but I also, Trey, thank you for putting on programs like this. It's necessary. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank so you. Did, your bill get, did your bill get through committee? She yes, was working. Good. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Now I'll go through the house. <laughs> so, Dr. Fayez, we are, mm -hmm. like Marvin Penn Jarvis says, we gets getting warmer. Uh, we're supposed yeah. to have enough vaccine by May. And mm -hmm. I do. And look, like he said, Texas, they dropped their mandatory mask uh, requirement. They're opening up their state 100 percent. Yes. And, you know, I'm so glad that you bring this up. I'm I'm just if I have one second, I'm going to share my screen and just show um, yeah, please. a uh, one quick uh, example. And this is, uh, we are not trying to scare the, are you able to see my screen? No, I don't okay. see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Can you see it now? Yep. Yeah. We can see it. Okay. Great. There you go. Um, so what we're seeing is I'm not trying to, you know, add fear, but there are variants across the United States right now. Some of the most notable ones that we have here are the B117. I try not to call them by the name of where they came from, but this one is the one that originated in the UK. Um, and then B1351, this is the one that originated in South Africa. Um, these are strains across the entire United States and the number of cases um, updated on March 1st on the CDC website. And there is one thing for a strain to be more lethal. There is one thing for a strain to be more transmissible. Uh, which one is worse? Um, you know, who knows? And I don't want to be there to find that out. This is an example of San Diego and researchers putting prospective studies out there of what would happen if there were um, if there was no vaccination, but current protective behavior and current protective behavior is wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, mm -hmm. having those restrictions in place. Um, and then also with a fast, fast vaccine rollout versus fast vaccine rollout and protective behavior relaxed. Um, so just I just wanted to show those graphs. I know that looks like a lot of data points, <laughs> but the what I ultimately want to tell people is that there there are variant strains in the United States. And yes, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine has shown that it will 
have a protective barrier to those variants uh, because it was tested in the time where there were variants already across the across the world. But we want to be mindful and not go backwards by taking right. away these restrictions. Um, I'm not saying that businesses, you know, a specific, I'm not calling for um, shutdown or anything extreme, but just personal protective barriers that we've been practicing or encouraging people to practice for the last year. Common I'm sense. Recommended. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, common sense, which ain't so common, girl. I don't know if you I, know that. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Yeah. yeah, well, listen, Dr. Humna Fayez, medical consultant for the Division of Acute Disease at DHEC, uh, Bishop Eric Freeming, the meeting place, and uh, Reverend Raphael Ashford with St. Luke Episcopal, Representative Annie McDaniel, and also Representative um, uh, Patricia Hannigan, and of course, uh, Marvin Pendarvis also joined us. I want to thank Dr. Sylvia Boley for uh, joining us. She uh, has been backstage um, just uh, Oh. You know, commenting. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> commenting. Uh, Luther Batiste says he is watching. Uh, Mitchell Peace Joy Jen says great biblical examples. Listen, um, just some final words from everybody. I, I mean, I am so passionate about this because I, I see that we are. I mean, what's the what is the um, scripture? Um, either Bishop Freeman or. Uh, Bishop Ashford about we perish for the lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That just keeps coming to my mind. I mean, I'm telling you, we're almost one year. We're in March. It was last year this time that we started. And I will never forget, I was sitting on the couch right over there with a four-year-old and a two-year-old watching my pastor because we were no longer going to church. And he had his doctor on, uh, Dr. Tasha Boone. And I thought to myself, this is such great information and people need to hear it. And I just started the show because I know that one, there is a huge portion of our community that only get their news and information from social media. They're not watching CNN. They're not watching MSNBC. They're not watch, listening to NPR like me. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a geek. I'm a news geek. They're getting their information from BET, TV One, and from social media where there is huge amounts of misinformation, An innuendo, fake news, if you will. So I just said, I've got to, do, this is what I could do. And we can all do something to help our communities, whatever that community you're in. Mm -hmm. So I just pray and hope as we enter into this, this, this full year, year two of COVID, that we are all doing what we can do to help mm -hmm. inform the community, dispel the rumors and help us because mm -hmm. we are dying, we are sick, Mm -hmm. And and I'm a believer, so I believe everything that's supposed to happen is supposed to happen. Yeah. But some things we can do something about. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give everyone's um, final word uh, on this show today about what one you think your responsibility is and what we're going to do and how we can change the trajectory. Mm -hmm. Six percent of black folks have gotten vaccinated as opposed to 63% of non-Black folk, mm -hmm. Black and Brown, because it's Asian Americans also. It's Hispanic Americans also. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll start with you, uh, Bishop Freeman. Take well, us to church. I, well, uh, you, you've done that quite well already, Trey, <laughs> and um, we appreciate everything you've shared. I'm Mark, passionate you, about it. I really and am. We, and we should be. It, it, if, we, if we love community, um, we should be. Uh, Martin Luther said that we're saved by faith and faith alone, but mm -hmm. faith that is alone is not faith at all. Mm -hmm. And the book of James says faith without works is dead. Dead. Fun, definitely not intended. And so as faith leaders, we have a responsibility to demonstrate and challenge our community, our parishioners, and those that are believers that are streaming, uh, connected to this, to, 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 to give a witness of our faith by stewarding our temples well. Uh, and this is, a, this is an opportunity uh, to, to lift a witness that we may not have for another hundred years. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. But we need to have works that accompany our faith. Thank you, Bishop Freeman. Father Raphael. Uh, <clears throat> I think about the scripture where Jesus tells the person that your faith has made you well. And I think a lot of times we say that we have faith, but when crises hit, 
that's when the rubber hit, rubber hits yeah, the road. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of people who will say that, but when faced with the vaccine or faced with even stepping outside, that faith is not there. So from my pulpit, I try to continue to teach faith and that you just can't have faith when things are going well, but you also have to have faith when things are not going so well. And I think modeling, I think as Dr. Belay, that's it right? Uh, Holy, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> I wrote it down too. Um, I, Me I, too. I, Fanatically. I did too. Um, <laughs> modeling. We have to model and not be afraid to, I say, challenge or check those things that we know are not true, whether it's on Facebook or in our own families or friends. But my bottom line is, and I know my parishioners are probably tired of hearing me talk about faith, but I firmly believe if you have faith, then you have to trust at some point and faith is not convenient. You either have it all the time, whether things are good or bad, you just can't have it when it's, uh, you know, you know uh, when it's good. When it's so convenient, I will, yeah. Yes, when it's convenient, yes. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you, Father Ashford. Uh, Representative Hennigan and then um, Representative McDaniel, can you ladies? Well, you know, one of the things that I always believe in that let the work I've done speak for me. Mm. And, and I believe that wholeheartedly that it is my work to make sure that if my community is not doing something, it's my responsibility to get out there and to show them, you know, and, and the best way to do it, I had my shots done and I let them know I am fine. Right. I'm happy that I did. And also, um, I have called uh, many, many homes, but not only that, the way that I started out in the beginning was to make sure, and this may be a little uh, different than others, but uh, I gave boxes of food away, you know, based upon the fact that you're going to go and get your shot. Mm -hmm. You have to use every means possible that you can to get people there. I've also contacted so many pastors and say, make this part of your sermon the sermon that you're going to preach to save lives. And and many of them have done that. I've also gone to talk to people in healthcare systems to talk about the need for them to have mobile, you know, mobile health centers out in the community. Everyone does not have a car. Right. You know, and, and, and they have to pay. And a lot of times you find out that people in rural areas don't have it because they don't know. Right, and it's not in our favor right now in mm -hmm. many of the rural areas because we don't have it. So quite often we think that they know something when they sincerely don't. They don't. You know, if you don't have broadband, if you don't have a computer, you don't have these things. How do you know that these things are happening? That's so right. It's our responsibility to get out there and let people know. If we say that we are legislators, that means servants, mm -hmm. and as servants, we need to be out there educating our community. And if we're not doing that, then someone else is serving our places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Representative Pat Hannigan, uh, Representative Annie McDaniel, uh, would you like to share? Yes, yes. Um, uh, Representative Hennigan and I, we share a lot of the same things that we do when we talk about uh, different things we do in our community. So uh, as I spoke earlier about some of the things I were doing, I'm, that I'm doing in my community and getting the word out with social media, mm -hmm and with the human services and other agencies mm -hmm. within uh, the county. As I stated, I, re I represent both, um, I, I represent Chester, Fairfield, and Richland. So those are relatively different communities. Yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I'm still using social media, still using the virtual platforms um, to get the sure. word out. And I think as a legislator, as um, Representative Hennigan stated, we are public servants. We're here to right. serve. So it's our responsibility to do all that we can and engage the bottom down um, other governmental agencies to ensure that we're getting this word out. Then I want to speak just real quickly about opening up South Carolina. And I want to encourage everyone who's watching on Trey, please, you all take the responsibility for your life in your own hands. Yes. Do the things that CDC is telling you to do. Regardless of whether or not you have a, go a governor or elected officials who are trying to do things to keep you safe, do not count on that because we know everyone is not for us. So we must take that responsibility in our own hands. Keep your hands washed. Keep the social distancing. Mm -hmm. 
we are here together. You notice I didn't have my mask on earlier because I was in the office by myself. But once they came in, I wanted to make sure that I put it on. <laughs> yeah. stay safe. Right. So I just want to again thank you, thank the panelists. You all did great. And uh, I'm going to be watching your show a lot more. Love well, it. thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Dr. Sylvia Bowley. I think I got it right. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm a high five my own self. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Trey, as always, just for getting this information out. And it's so important. That's why I stuck around, because I just think it's so important that people see us together talking yeah. about it. A lot of times, you know, science is pitted against faith and we're pitted yeah. against one another, yeah. but we work hand in hand. God created the universe. He created yeah. science. Okay. Don't get me preaching. So like, <laughs> we to do. So when we come together like this, it's a beautiful thing. And it shows people that these conspiracy theories are not really true and they're not rooted in, in the truth. And God rejoices in the spirit of truth. Um, as a clinician, one who dealt with my own fear of getting over it. I think dealing with that fear is central. I say the cure to fear is faith, right? But that's not just faith, yes, in the Bible, but it's also faith in the science and the whole span of things that we have learned and people have shown over time. So really taking time to really explore that fear and cast it out. It says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, fear. power, love, and a sound mind. And scientifically, we know that when we think with outside of fear, we're able to use our higher functioning. So that will make us receptive to the facts that there are out there. And we can actually hear this information comprehended and then make an intelligent decision, a wisdom-based decision on how we will proceed. So thank you so much to everyone on the panel, yes. all the work you do. And from Maryland to South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Boley. Dr. Fias, thank you again so much for joining us. Can you uh, give us some closing comments? And uh, we do have a question that I want to ask you from uh, one of our viewers before we leave. Go ahead. Okay. Well, well, you know, all in all, like everyone said, misinformation breeds greater mistrust. And so being informed is is a free like commodity that we have nowadays. So and especially in faith based groups as well, that is your chance to make it personal. Talk about survival stories. Um, I, th I just think COVID-19 has taken so much from us um, in this like small time just this past year. And you don't want to be added to the number of cases losses or disabilities that have come through it. And you might have had you might have been fortunate with your bout of COVID having minimal disease, but the vaccine is all we have right now. And so I would recommend staying six feet um, from others, um, mask, keep your mask up and uh, take the shot. That that is my recommendation. Yeah, we do have a question. Angela Ori says that she didn't get to watch the beginning of the session. She said her neighbor was just telling her that her doctor suggested she not take the vaccine because of her allergies. Is there a reason because of allergies, Dr. F Fayez, that she should or someone should not take the vaccine, in your opinion? So um, the CDC for the first two or all the vaccines now that have come out, that, that material that I included, the ingredient of polysorbate. So if you have had a serious allergic reaction and that's not just um, that's not just swelling, that's, you know, with your throat and having other symptoms that would be considered serious um, to uh, that ingredient. It's a common ingredient in a lot of laxatives. Um, so if you've had a serious allergic reaction to something with that ingredient, I would talk further with your doctor. But if you have had allergies, for example, an egg allergy um, or just seasonal allergies um, to other ingredients, I would recommend getting the vaccine. Um, just go through the ingredient list. Um, it's all on the DHEC website and the CDC website. And if you've had a major reaction to any of those, an allergic reaction, that is when I would consider talking to your doctor further um, and maybe delaying it. Um, but for everything else, uh, there are no contraindications to getting the vaccine if you have an allergy. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much. That is Dr. Uh, Humna 
Fayaz with uh, DHEC. We also spoke with Dr. Sylvia Boley from Maryland. Also Bishop Eric Freeman with The Meeting Place, Reverend Raphael Ashford with St. Luke's Episcopal, which by the way, Reverend Ashford, it's not only The Meeting Place folks on here shouting out Bishop Freeman. Some of your folks are saying hi, Shauna Hicks. And also uh, Luther Batiste said that they're watching and thank you for, for your leadership. Also State Representative Annie McDaniel and Marvin Pendarvis and a State Representative Pat Hennigan. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Sorry. I think, yes, Sorry. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can we get you to do one quick thing? What is I can, it? What is, I can do two things. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> what is the ingredient that uh, she mentioned? Oh, it's polysorbate. It's in it's in laxatives that you can buy over the counter, um, okay. like Miralax. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we encourage everyone, if you did not join us for the beginning of the show, uh, we had some great information from both of our doctors that were shared. So please, please, please not only post and share, but let folks know what is and what ain't about the vaccine. It is all of our responsibilities. It's all of our responsibilities. If we know something, we have got to share it. And listen, I know that there is not only, and we didn't even get to this, and I know we're running behind, there's not only fear about getting the vaccine, it's fear if you say you're going to get the vaccine. I know Dr. Bowley said that there was a whole campaign melanated and vaccinated, <laughs> you know, among the health community. And, uh, you know, if you tell people you're getting vaccinated, people look at your side eyes. So there's so much we need to work on within our communities. And I do believe it's all of our responsibilities to do what we can do. And we need the, the faith, the faith community to say, listen, God loves us. He's going to protect us. We, we, you know, people love and respect you all. It's up to our legislators to do what we can do in mm -hmm. our communities. Mm -hmm. Reverend Mc, I mean, um, Annie McDaniel mentioned something about, um, I, I mean, uh, Pat Hennigan mentioned something about food. Man, what mm -hmm. if we get a DJ and a fish fry? Please, <laughs> please, we can vaccinate a whole heap of people. Y'all better stop playing because that's what it's going to take. It's and a few take. hot dogs for the children. Man, what? Bring uh -uh. Up. And some red juice. Listen, I'm just saying. <laughs> and then we need our medical professionals to not only tell us the information, but tell us how we can understand it. Sometimes, you know, you're just talking over our heads. We don't know what you're talking about. And to make sure when you're in those meetings that we that you are looking out for those folks in the rural communities and the, the black and brown people because those funds need to go be funneled into those communities where we can get access. You got to win in Rome. You got to do what Romans do. And in black Rome, we eat fish, we drink red juice, and we listen to music. And I know I'm making somebody mad right now, but I'm just talking about the truth. <laughs> so anyway, so listen, thank you all so much for joining us again. In It Together and uh, SDD Hack and also um, the South Carolina uh, Diabetes Advisory Council present Wellness Wednesday, every Wednesday here on Coping with COVID. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'd love to uh, further the conversation. As we leave, I, tr I typically leave, leave with a reading from Jesus Calling, but Father Raphael Ashford said he would le leave us with a prayer. So uh, Pastor, Bishop, Sir Ashford, if you could please leave us with a prayer, we would appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and for this time together to reflect and to disseminate information to the community regarding the vaccines. We ask that you continue to help us and those others who may have information that can benefit our communities to be able to get the information out. And may we by leaders lead by example and may we be able to uh, get into those communities where there is still stress and strife and untrust and be able through God's help to have a non-anxious presence as we try to, to best educate and, and inform those who may still be fearful. I give you thanks for the, mar for the I give you thanks for the uh, marvels of, um, of modern medicine and for those who have been given the gifts to understand it and to transfer it to us. And may we in the faith communities, the medical communities, politics, and any other 
avenues that we might have at your disposal to be able to reach our community so that we can save more lives. I ask that you watch over us and give us the knowledge and strength to do so. All of these things I ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Reverend Raphael Ashford with St. Luke's Episcopal Church. Thank you again so much for joining us today on Coping okay. with COVID. Listen, if a, you have a uh, product or service that could help someone cope with COVID, please email copingwithtraytaylor at gmail.com. We would love for you to be a proud sponsor of a Coping with COVID, just like SCD Heck, uh, In It Together, the South Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council, Javis Tax Service, also uh, Palmetto Media Connections, and uh, the City of Columbia Office of Business Opportunities. Also, if you have a story that could help someone cope with COVID, please go to the uh, TaylorMade production page and inbox me. I would love for you to be a guest on Coping with COVID. Now, tomorrow we're going to do a broadcast of an amazing cycling group that is not only cycling throughout the state, but they are doing some amazing outreach work. Iron Riders Cycling Club. We're going to do a rebroadcast of that because my sweet, beautiful aunt, um, Audrey, Toby Claire Hagler passed away and I'm going to travel to uh, attend her funeral tomorrow. Friday, Faith Friday. You won't want to miss this interview with Sergio Hudson. Do you know who Sergio Hudson is? He is the Ridgeway South Carolina designer who has done stuff for Beyonce, Jennifer Lopez, and also he made that fabulous uh, outfit for our forever first lady, Michelle Obama. He has such a funny story about how he found out that she was uh, wearing her outfit because he didn't know she was going to wear it. And uh, what he did next and how it is definitely transforming his career. And I'm going to wear my Sergio Hudson dress. I've got two Sergio Hudson dresses. I'm going to wear one of my Sergio Hudson dresses during the interview on Friday. That's Faith Friday coming up this Friday on Coping with COVID. And then next Wednesday on Wellness Wednesday, please join us as we talk about diabetes and eye care health. And also we're going to talk with Phyllis Allen with DHEC and she's going to tell us about how to eat and she's going to do an actual cooking demonstration, all that and so much more coming up on Coping with COVID. I'm Trey Taylor. Until the next time, I wish you peace and abundant blessings. And I ask you to please be careful, stay safe and wear your mask over your nose and under your chin. Blessings to you guys. Coping with COVID and In It Together present Wellness Wednesday, brought to you by the Diabetes Advisory Council of South Carolina and DHEC's Division of Diabetes and Heart Disease Management. Coping, Coping with COVID with Trey Taylor.